Hello, everybody, and welcome to Sake Revolution. This, in case you haven't heard, is America's first sake podcast. I'm your host, John Puma, from the Sake Notes. Also, the internet sake discord guy, the r slash sake reddit guy, and uh, definitely not the sake samurai guy. All right, and I am your host, Timothy Sullivan. I am the sake samurai guy. I am also a sake educator, as well as the founder of the Urban Sake website. And every week, John and I will be here tasting and also chatting about all things sake and doing our best to make it fun and easy to understand. That's right. And if today you are joining us for the first time, you are in luck because you can go back one episode and start (laughs) at the beginning of this little series that we're doing. Tim, we're in episode two of our series on the different pressing methods. Yes. Uh, You want to give a quick little recap about what we went over in episode one? Sure. So the previous episode for our mini series on sake pressing, just a quick recap What is pressing all about? Well, when you've got your sake mash, you need to separate the alcohol from the unfermented rice. And we do this in a step which we call pressing. I mean, it's a good, straightforward and accurate name, in (laughs) my opinion. You have your bags. You got your moromi in the bags. You you, you, Literally, you press and then the sake comes out. That is – no. there's no magic to this one. It's just (laughs) pressing. And is there like – is it – Understood as pressing in Japanese? Well, it's called shibori in Japanese, and that means squeezing, actually. Mm, Squeezing, squeezing, pressing. Yeah. Guys, we went into a lot more detail on this in the previous episode. (laughs) Can you think of any other sakes that have shibori in them? Anything ring a bell? Shibori tate? Yes, you got it. Ding, ding, ding. Shibori tate. Ah. That's freshly squeezed or freshly pressed sake. All right. Good one. So last week we talked about the fune or the boat method. (laughs) Remember that? The boat method. I I didn't realize we were going to go nautical on that first one, but yeah, the boat method. Ahoy matey. Um, Yes. We uh, talked about the boat and how you fill these bags called fukuro. They're like long, skinny pillowcase type bags you fill Mm -hmm. them with the moromi mash and then you lay them in a box and then pressure is applied from above and there's a hole in the front bottom section of the box and clear sake is pressed through the fabric and comes out clear so that is our fune method recap but today (laughs) we're talking about fune method recap (laughs) yes today we're talking about another method and yes, yes. Uh, this is a this is a fun one. I think yeah. this is a fun method, in my opinion, um, because it's as far as I'm aware, the only one that's got like the Xerox effect going on <laughs> for its naming. Well, before we get to the Xerox effect, we can call this <laughs> the Asaku Ki method. So Asaku means compression, and Ki mm-hmm. means machine. So the general term for this is Asaku Ki. And that would be the machine that does the compression. But there is a much more widely used term for this method. And John, do you know what that is? Well, I I do. But I want to say first that I think once or twice in my life have I ever heard the proper name for the method. (laughs) For me, it has always, always been known as Yabuta. Yabuta. Yes. So what, well, tell us what you know about Yabuta. So what I know about Yabuta is that there is a large machine that looks a little bit like an accordion, like a giant accordion. Yes. And it is hydraulically pushed from one end Mm -hmm. and the sake comes out the front. Okay. <laughs> well, that's the Cliff Notes version. <laughs> it is. Well, you know, that that's what I'm here for. The deep dives come from the sake samurai. Yes, so we're going to we're going to n- nestle into the education corner right now. Oh, and cozy, cozy. When I first looked at the Yabuta, and we should explain that Yabuta is a brand name for this machine, mm-hmm. like Q-tip or Kleenex Xerox. or Xerox. So this is a brand name, one maker's name that is 
very dominant in the space, and their brand kind of took over the terminology for the machine. But technically, again, it's called asaku, which means compression. Mm-hmm. So, but many, many, many people also call it yabuta for the process, and it does look like a giant accordion. And it does have one giant metal arm on one side that compresses. And the the press itself is made up of frames. So I want you to think like picture frames stacked one next to the other, and then they make up a long row of them. And each one has about one inch of depth to it. And a lot of people looking at this machine assume that this giant hydraulic arm sticking off one end is what squeezes the whole contraption and gets the sake to come out. But that is not true. Not the whole, no, not quite like that. No. No. (laughs) It would be awesome if it was. So the way it works in a nutshell is that the compression arm on the side holds all the frames together. And then the mash is pumped in along the top and goes down into those sections between each frame. So there's that little bit of space between each frame And then every other frame is actually a bladder or a balloon. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So every other frame is metal and solid and firm. And then the next one is going to be a rubber bladder. And then they pump air into the bladders and they squeeze both sides. And that is what applies pressure to the mash that's trapped in those frames. And then at the bottom of the frame, there's a little slit where liquid gets pushed out. So it is this series of frames that are pushed together, held together. The mash goes in, slides down inside each of the frames, and then compressed air is pumped into every other frame, and it expands as a a rubber balloon or rubber bladder in there. And then the liquid comes out the bottom. Hmm. Now, what makes it interesting is that then you can release the frames and open them up. And inside is waiting what? What, What's going to be in there? Is this going to be something I have to clean? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) It's sake kasu, of course. Oh, yes. Yes. So all the leftover unfermented rice is left in these frames. And then you can scrape them out. And then that sake kasu is the byproduct of sake production. Yeah. And uh, I do remember from uh, visiting you when you were um, an intern over at Hakaisan, and you were telling us stories about cleaning the yabuta. Yes. Um, and, and how there, there is a lot, there's a lot of kasu. <laughs> it's a great deal of kasu. Because this machine is impressively large. Yes. At least the one that you guys had was. It's very large. You can picture like, 150 to 200 frames. And once the pressing is done, now the Fune method we talked about last week, that takes about two days, the whole process. Mm -hmm. So once you load the bags in, you let the gravity pull out what it can, then you start pressing down. Then you may rearrange the bags a little bit, press some more. So that whole process is like two days. And the Yabuta method takes only about one day. So this cut the pressing time in half, moving to this automated pressing machine. Hmm. And a lot of these pressing machines are also located in refrigerated rooms so that the sake never reaches room temperature, even while it's being pressed. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And there's different configurations of these machines as far as how you deal with the kasu or the leftover pressings. The place where I worked had a conveyor belt below. So when you opened up the frame, you scraped it out, it would just fall down and hit a conveyor belt and be moved along. But that sounds much more pleasant than the alternative. Yeah. I mean, some breweries I visited had like a large metal tray on rolling casters. Like, you know, those sweater boxes you put under your bed that have the from the container store that had yes, the rope. Yes, I ro- do, actually. Yeah. So something like that made out of stainless steel, and it would fall down in, and you had to roll it out, pick it up, and do something with it. 
a little mini mine car. Yeah. And the most labor intensive method is having to scrape out the kasu and collect it piece by piece on your hand and then place it somewhere, like literally scrape it out and carefully place it in a bag or on a, on a collection table. And that is the most difficult because if you scrape it a certain way and it doesn't fall out in one piece, you've got a broken piece of kasu and it's very stressful. So letting it fall down and have it collected automatically is, is the most time efficient way to do it. Mm, a broken piece of kasu is very <laughs> stressful. This, yes. is, this is some fortune cookie stuff. We need to <laughs> harvest this. Yeah. I mean, the reason is some breweries package up their kasu in plastic bags and they sell it. And mm-hmm. if a piece is broken, it's not as beautiful in the package. So they want them to come out really clean and neat if they're going to be selling them as is. So that's the reason that for that. Sense. That makes sense. I do want to say that cleaning out the yabuta was my favorite job of everything I did at the brewery. I loved that job the best. You mentioned it was very zen. It was very zen. You had, we had a time target for scraping all the kasu out of each panel. Okay. So I had to like, okay, I have to do this in 45 seconds. And there was an automated panel mover that would slide the next panel over on like a chain. So I knew that the panel was going to come flying at me in 45 seconds. So I had to scrape. <laughs> flying scrape, at you? <laughs> flying at me. There was a manual button, but you could also set it on automatic. So when they mm-hmm. were first training me, they did it manually where I would scrape, scrape, scrape. We would get both sides. So you're facing another person on the other side and you're both scraping one half of the panel. And so we would do it. He would push a button and then the panel would fly from your left to your right. And then there would be another panel with fresh kasu and you'd scrape that out. But there was also an automatic setting, which was much higher pressure. Think about, you know, Lucy in the candy factory when the candies start coming down the conveyor belt. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> she, and you she gotta, can't wrap you them. Gotta, <laughs> Can you can you quickly turn it to manual if you become overwhelmed? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay, they, they, it was completely safe, but uh, they wanted to keep the time pressure going so that you know you had to strike a balance between thoroughness and efficiency, as always. That's yeah. It's usually how it goes. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, but th- the reason it was my favorite thing is because of the aroma. Mm. So the sm- oh yeah, that must be really pleasant. Yeah, it was amazing. It was sometimes almost overwhelming, like the the wafting sake, boozy Mm. aromas coming off the fresh, freshly squeezed kasu was, it was fantastic, but sometimes it hits you really hard. (laughs) Sometimes it hit you really hard? (laughs) Okay. Yeah, but it was, it was fun and engaging. Some steps of sake making, like when you're in the koji room, there's periods of activity, but then you need to wait sometimes. So you're sitting around waiting for something to, you know, finish or some certain amount of time to elapse or for the temperature to change to a certain temperature. Like the koji needed to go down two more degrees in temperature before we can go on to the next step. Mm-hmm. And you'd just be waiting, waiting, waiting. But this was like, once you got started, it was like you went straight through 200 panels and it kept you very focused and time would fly by. And uh, I really enjoyed that. That was very engaging and I felt like you're being really productive. Nice. Yeah. I like that. That sounds good. That's it. Productive, uh, time <clears throat> flying by. These are things that are good at, you know, these are <laughs> good qualities in work. Yes. Nice. Uh, speaking of work, actually, no, speaking of not work <laughs> at all, my understanding is that much like last episode, we have a sake with us today that was made using this method. Yes, we are going to be tasting a sake from Niigata. This was actually very close in the same region where I was working, but not the same brewery. Mm -hmm. This is from a brewery called Shirataki, and they're in Echigo Yuzawa, Niigata. Mm -hmm. And we are tasting their Junmai, which is known as, they call it the aqua. And that's because, aqua, aqua, yeah. And that's because of the blue color of the bottle. 
aqua colored glass bottle. <laughs> yeah. Now, John, do you want to give us the stats for the Jozen Junmai? I would love to, Tim. So the Jozen Aqua is, as you mentioned, a Junmai from the brewery known as Shirataki mm-hmm. over in Niigata. This has a an ABV of seventeen to eighteen percent, sir. This is a this is a, a high alcohol sake. I think you are trying to get us drunk. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, the sake meter value is plus seven, and that's that. That's that rating of uh, kind of sweet to dry, mm-hmm. with dry being the higher plus numbers, and plus seven is pretty damn high. <laughs> yeah, this is one of the higher SMVs we've had on the show. Plus seven. I think so. I think so. Um, let's see. Acidity is 1.6. A little high. Mm-hmm. And the sake rice was polished down to 70%. And the rice in question that was polished is Go Hyakuman Goku and uh, Koshi Ibuki. Yep. I'm not that familiar with Koshi Ibuki, although Go Hyakuman Goku, you know, very, very popular rice on this podcast. Yes. All right. Well, let's get this sake into our glass. Ah, that's some advice to live by. All right. So we have Mm. our Jozen Aqua Junmai in the glass. And mine looks pretty darn clear. I don't see any. This is one of the clearest sakes I think I've ever seen. Yeah. You know. It looks like water. It's so clear. Yes. That is, I would say, indicative of the region. Niigata really loves water clear sake. And they mm-hmm. do that through charcoal filtering. And I think that that's a safe bet that this sake was charcoal filtered to give it that super clear water-like appearance, which I, I really like. Nice, nice. Yeah. Let's give it a smell. Yeah, I'm floored at how clear this is. This is- <laughs> dramatic (laughs) what are you getting on the nose well it's very restrained isn't it yeah there's not a lot not a lot and that's another regional Nigata specialty (laughs) Um, a little bit of rice aroma not too fruity yeah i get a little bit of rice and i do get a little bit of booze um that it is Hmm. it's gonna be you know 17 to 18 percent it's gonna be hard to hide Hmm. But we do want to mention that this is a Junmai sake, so not one of those alcohol added styles, just mm-hmm. a pure rice style, about 17.5% alcohol. All right. So a little bit ricey, very light, very clear. So let's give it a taste. The rice comes through a lot more on the taste. Yeah. Like it was present in the aroma, let you know it was coming, um, and then and then once you take the sip, it's uh, it's it, they knock down the door and it's kind of Kool Aid Man coming in, but a giant, um, you know, giant shampaku. a giant Yabuta crashing through <laughs> there the wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it is dry, wouldn't you say? Oh yeah, no, it's yeah. very dry. The finish is dry. It is dry, it is crisp, it is a little bit ricey. It's, a little bit it ricey. Is, it has that that clean, crisp mm. finish that, um, it, dare I say, is indicative of the region. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you pick this stuff up, Puma? I don't know, hang out with these people. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so the only thing I would say that isn't super Niigata regional about this sake is the alcohol percentage. Normally... Mm-hmm. You know, 14, 15% light, clean, crisp, water like, uh, and dry. But this, they pumped up the alcohol and uh, that gives it some oomph. That little, the Kool Aid man impression <laughs> <laughs> crashing through the wall. Yeah. And, and you can, yeah, that oomph is there. It is, mm. it is boozy. Like, I think that that is noticeable when mm. you sip it. It's kind of, especially if you take a big sip. It's it's very like oh wow this this is uh, this is not subtle at all <laughs> it's, it's not being masked by anything it's it's very much there it's mm-hmm. not altogether unwelcome it's mm. nice it's just I don't think I've had sake recently 
where I tasted it and was like, wow, this this tastes like it has a high alcohol content. <laughs> but this definitely does. <laughs> You know what I mean, though. Usually, it's kind of yeah. You know, they'll 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 pump the sweetness up or something like that. Yeah, and I think you know the the overall type of sake this is. I think is clean, easy drinking, and you can throw it against all types of hearty food. Mm-hmm. Definitely, so that um, alcohol this, this level wants needs hearty food. To me, it comes across, and you you pointed out a few times as well that it it is very regionally distinct in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Are there specific foods in Niigata, you you did spend a year there, Mm -hmm. that do you think that that is in mind to go with this style of sake? Mm, That's a great question. Many of the Niigata brewers that I've spoken with, they've said that their goal is to pair as widely as possible. Mm -hmm. So the aroma is a little less distinct, the aroma is a little more reserved, The sake is very clear in color. So use of activated carbon to make the sake really clear and water-like. And the overall dry, very lightly ricey, kind of gentle aroma, that's meant to pair as broadly as possible. So I don't think there's an intent for this to pair with a a hyper-local dish. But the most famous food from this region, by far, is koshihikari rice. So there's an eating rice in Japan, koshihikari, which Mm -hmm. is the most expensive by the pound eating rice you can buy. And it grows all around this region. Mm. So that's really what this area is super well known for, is this very delicious and very coveted type of eating rice, koshihikari. Mm. So... Ricey sake to go with very premium rice. It's interesting. Yeah. Uh, and have you had Koshi Kari rice before? Oh my gosh. Where I worked, the company cafeteria served it every day. Oh, okay. So it was <laughs> it was available. Be like, Our pillows were filled day. with Koshi Kari rice. <laughs> <laughs> it literally grew all around the brewery. And oh, wow. they would have two rice makers. The, the company cafeteria was like a buffet service and you'd come in and everyone would stand in line with their tray, just like a high school cafeteria. But at the end, they had two giant rice makers filled to the brim with koshi hikari and you could just serve yourself. And I got so spoiled that whole year. <laughs> can you can you get koshi hikari in the States? You can, but it's not the same because the, the uh, very best is the shinmai or like the fresh harvested koshi hikari. Oh, and that's definitely not going to be something you get here. Yeah. It's got to sit on a boat for a while, I would imagine. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. While we're on the topic, though, so mm. koshi hikari rice is, a, is obviously an eating rice, but there have been eating rices that have crossed the threshold. In Niigata, yes. are they making sake with koshi hikari? There are some examples of that, but Mm -hmm. it's not as common as you would think. It's like the most Mm -hmm. common rice of that region, but it's not as common for sake. I've seen it used in some beers, Oh, and I'm sure there are some sake brewers who use koshi hikari, but many breweries that I visited don't use it regularly for their sake. Very interesting. So, Tim, you know, now we, we've talked about Yabuta. We've talked about cleaning Yabuta. Uh, we've <laughs> sipped sake made with uh, Yabuta. I have a question for you. D- do you think, and I think this is probably a very subjective question, do mm. you think that the pressing method in this case, or in the case of the two that we've gone over so far, do you think that influences the flavor of the sake. Mm, That's really interesting. You know, I mentioned in our Fune episode, the previous episode, that some breweries use multiple pressing methods. At the brewery where I worked, we had a Yabuta and we had a very small Fune. Mm -hmm. And the Yabuta was used for the day in, day out, majority of the sakes. And the little fune was used for only the ultra-premium sakes. 
So there is some differentiation based on the grade or you know quality of the sake that you're pressing. The yabuta would generally be the work a day, faster, more common method for pressing the sake. And something like the fune is more labor intensive, more hands on, and more human intervention. And that's usually reserved for the more premium styles of sake. Hmm. But some breweries only have one press, whether it's a fune press or a yabuta press, and mm. they just have one pressing method for all their sakes. Now, I know that Shirataki uses yabuta because on their website, they have a video of the brewers cleaning out two different yabutas, and I know that they use them at their brewery. So, you know, for a Junmai grade sake, it's almost guaranteed ironclad that it would be pressed with that more accessible, more approachable pressing method that's mm. fast and more reliable, which is the yabuta. Ooh, so okay. you, I don't think sipping a sake, you can really tell necessarily which pressing method was used based on the mm -hmm. taste alone. But usually by the grade and classification, if there is going to be a difference, Yabuta is usually for the more approachable entry-level sakes. Hmm. All right. That's interesting. Um, yeah. I think that it, it has me really looking forward to our next episode. Yes. That's it. So yeah, next week, guys, tune in once again and uh, see the exciting finale of our, our pressing series. It's going to be a full court press. Oh. <laughs> I was saving that one all episode. <laughs> okay, I'm trying John's to make not... like a squeeze the life out of you, joke, <laughs> but I can't quite make it work. So anyway, <laughs> John's not laughing, so I'm going to have to insert the laugh track when we edit the episode. We, we just need to get you. Just need to make like a a, a John laughing, uh, uh, you know, just a, a, a button. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Well, we had our fune. And we had our Yabuta, mm -hmm. and uh, I am excited for what's coming next week, our final pressing method that we're going to look into. And John, great to taste with you as always. And I want to thank our listeners as well for tuning in. We really do hope that you're enjoying our show. If you would like to show your support for Sake Revolution, the very best way that you can help us out and show your support would be to back us on Patreon. This is a listener-backed show. We appreciate all of our listeners. And one thing that all of our listeners can do to help us out is going to your podcast platform of choice and writing a review. Writing reviews is still a great way to help out your favorite sake podcast. It gets the show higher on the ratings that when people go looking for sake, this is what they see. This is, that's, it's, all, it's all the algorithm, guys. <laughs> but also you can do it the old fashioned way. Tell your friends, tell your friends, tell your family, get them to subscribe, you know, set a good example and you subscribe yourself uh, this way every week. When we release a new episode, it'll pop into your device of choice and you will not need to do anything else. It just happens. It's, isn't that nice when life just happens and things occur and you've got wonderful sounds on your phone. I think it is. <laughs> All right. And if you would like to learn more about any of the topics or sakes we tasted in today's episode, be sure to visit our website, my favorite domain, sakerevolution.com, for all the detailed show notes. And for all of your sake question needs, we've got you covered. Please reach out to us at feedback at sakerevolution.com, and we will read every one of those questions that come through, and we'll even answer most of them, too. Uh, so until next time, please remember to keep drinking sake, everybody, and come on.